Okay, I think we'll, oh, we'll get started. Um, it's my pleasure as the chair of the full AGU meeting, we're not allowed to wear our name bags, badges, so I thought we would introduce ourselves. So it's my pleasure as the full um, meeting chair to welcome you all to uh, this lecture. I thought I would just take a couple of moments to say a few things about the fall meeting as people are still coming in and getting seated. Um, this year's meeting, we have about 16,000 papers, and we're expecting a registration of around 19,000 people. That makes us actually the largest international meeting in the physical sciences. So um, your presence here this week um, has quite an impact. So as many of you know, for many years now, we have had a union-wide lecture at this meeting, a union-wide science lecture, the frontiers of geophysics, which continues this year also. Um, but this year, we have our first science and policy lecture, union-wide lecture. We're delighted that Dr. John Holdren will give this uh, lecture today. And um, this really reflects the increasing nature of the integration of our science with societal needs and with impacts in public policy. And to give a formal introduction, uh, I'd like to introduce Mike McFadden, who's the AGU president. Thank you, Catherine. I have the uh, very distinct pleasure of introducing our uh, distinguished guest today, uh, Dr. John Haldren. Uh, John is the Assistant to the President for Science and Technology, a co-chair of the President's Council on Advisors and on Science and Technology, the Director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy. He holds degrees in aerospace engineering and plasma physics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Stanford University. He before his position at OSTP, he was a professor in both the Kennedy School at, uh, uh, excuse me, the Kennedy School of Government and the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Harvard University. And before that, a director of the nonprofit Woods Hole Research Center. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a foreign member of the Royal Society of London. He was also the president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2006. His title, as you can see on the screen, is Science Advice, Science Policy uh, in the Obama Administration. And just to let you know how committed John is to being here with us today at AGU, he's missing the White House Christmas party. <laughs> <laughs> so please give a very warm welcome to John Holdren. Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here and, a, and an honor uh, to uh, be able to address uh, so many members of this extraordinarily important uh, scientific society. And I was talking to some of your leaders uh, over lunch and, and commenting that among the many other distinguishing characteristics of the AGU is you do far better than the AAAS, and I'm looking at my fellow former AAAS President Jane Lubchenco down in the front row. You do much better than the AAAS in the fraction of your membership that comes to your annual meeting. In the AAAS, we have 130,000 members, but the most we've ever had, I think, at an annual meeting is 10 or 11,000. And you got 19,000 with attendance after only, uh, out of uh, only something like 53,000 members. So it, it's, it's a commentary on the, on the dedication and the commitment to interaction of the folks uh, in, in this society, and I congratulate you for it. Uh, I'm going to cover quite a lot of ground here, but still try to leave uh, some time for questions and answers at the end. But I'm going to start and end with the extraordinary characteristics uh, of our president, which are many, but particularly conspicuous in his commitment to the importance of science and technology for addressing uh, the many challenges uh, our country and indeed the world uh, face. Uh, this happens to be a quote uh, from the speech he gave just a few months after being inaugurated to the 2009 annual meeting of the National Academy of Sciences. He was the first president since John F. Kennedy to take the first opportunity after his inauguration to go to the National Academy and address it 
on the importance of science and technology to uh, the future of our country. I want to start with an enumeration of some of the major challenges that we face that are closely linked to science and technology, and I'll divide that into two parts, domestic and uh, global. Domestically, of course, uh, the economy uh, has to be uh, at or near the top of the priority list, uh, how we manage economic recovery and growth. And there, the role of science and technology is in large part as drivers of new products, new businesses, uh, new jobs, economic growth. Those drivers come from a variety of domains, uh, some of which I've listed here, infotech, biotech, nanotech, green tech, other kinds of tech that one uh, could list, and probably some kinds of tech that we haven't thought of yet. Uh, in healthcare, how you meet the challenge of getting uh, better outcomes for all Americans and at the same time controlling and even lowering costs, this is a challenge to which science and technology is uh, extremely germane, not just in the science and technology of medicine itself, but in the science and technology of using information in the healthcare system uh, to make it more effective and more efficient. In the domain of energy and climate, about which I will certainly uh, be having more to say this afternoon, uh, clearly uh, a major issue there is uh, not only the science of understanding climate, again I'll have more to say about that, but also in terms of the solutions, uh, particularly important will be cleaner and safer energy supply, uh, <clears throat> which will provide us not only uh, the possibility of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also reductions in oil imports, improvements in conventional air quality, and more. A whole set of other resource and environmental issues are also challenges, as again the people in this room are very well aware. The challenges of water, of land use, of coastal zones, toxics, biodiversity, uh, the overarching challenge of sustainability. Again, science and technology uh, immensely germane here. And the domain of national and homeland security, where there are enormous uh, continuing challenges uh, where science and technology have a contribution to make. Uh, the ability to detect and disarm improvised explosive devices. Uh, security for uh, our cyber systems and our power grid. Biodefense. Uh, how we ensure the safety and reliability of our shrinking U.S. nuclear weapons stockpile without using nuclear explosive testing to do it. Uh, in the global domain, uh, combating preventable and pandemic disease, how we can transform the global energy system and global land use practices uh, to avoid unmanageable climate change, and that is really what we have to do. No one country, uh, obviously, or even any small group of countries is going to solve uh, this problem by itself. Uh, deploying science and technology for poverty eradication, for development, and for adapting to the degree of climate change that we're unable to avoid. Uh, managing the competition for land and water, the competition among the different human uses for those crucial resources among food, fiber, biofuel, and ecosystem function, including the preservation of habitat to support biodiversity and including carbon sequestration in plants and soils <clears throat> so that the carbon doesn't end up adding to that in the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide. And maintaining the ecological integrity and productivity of the oceans, again, clearly a global challenge and one of enormous importance. And finally, the global challenge of how we reduce the risks from nuclear and biological weapons in the world. A few words now about how President Obama views these challenges. And I have to say, when I uh, met the President for an hour's one-on-one -on -one job interview in December of 2008, what we mostly spent the hour on was talking about this set of challenges and how he thinks about them, how I think about them, what we might be able to do about them. The first key element of his view of these challenges is that they are interdisciplinary and they are interconnected. They cannot be analyzed from the standpoint of one or only a few disciplines, and they can't be analyzed uh, separately. Second point is that science and technology are not just germane to these challenges, as I started out suggesting, but uh, they are central to the capacity to succeed. Third point is that success will require not only applying science and technology to these specific practical challenges, it will also require nurturing what uh, I like to call the cross-cutting foundations of strength in science and technology. I'll elaborate in a moment uh, on what I think those are. 
The point that science is central means that we need to put science and technology in the center of what the federal government thinks, says, and does about these challenges. And that's what President Obama meant when he said in his inaugural address, we're going to put science in its rightful place in this administration. Its rightful place is in the middle of discussions of how we deal with these challenges. And the interconnectedness and interdisciplinarity of these challenges means that solutions are going to require partnerships. Partnerships across different federal agencies, across the branches and levels of government, that is uh, legislative, executive, uh, judicial even, uh, levels of government, federal, state, regional, local, partnerships among the public, private, and philanthropic sectors, and partnerships among nations. And again, I'll have more to say about that. Say a few words about interconnectedness. Human well-being depends, uh, I think we all understand, equally on economic, environmental, and socio-political conditions. Depending equally really means that they're all indispensable. We can't live without any of them. A three-legged stool falls down if any leg is removed. And that means that true development and true growth really need to entail enhancing all three of these pillars, all three of these foundations, or at least not advancing one in ways that seriously degrade the others. A second element of interconnectedness, extremely important on the global scale, but also nationally, is that poverty, ignorance, environmental degradation, and disease are all linked in vicious circles of cause and effect. And these particular blights are most effectively, therefore, atta attacked together. And a very interesting element of this is that often a key to addressing all of them at once is improving the status and opportunities of women and girls all around the world. Another element of interconnectedness, a quite obvious one in our current context, is that using better technology and management to reduce health care costs while extending insurance coverage and improving outcomes is something that has a wide variety of economic benefits as well as social ones. And the clean energy revolution that we need to improve air and water quality and limit climate change risks is also going to bring high quality jobs, it's going to spin off new products and businesses, and it's going to preserve the economic competitiveness of this country. A few words then about the centrality of science and technology to these challenges. What exactly do we need from science and technology? In terms of the economy, we need faster innovation that yields better manufacturing techniques, better products and services, and thus high quality sustainable jobs. In the health domain, we need new information technology tools for medical records, for doctor to doctor and doctor patient interactions. We need better and cheaper diagnostics. We need faster vaccine development and production. If you didn't believe that, you only have to think back on the H1N1 episode where we were lucky. If that virus had been as deadly as we initially thought it was, uh, the consequences would have been immense because we simply were not able to develop and distribute vaccine uh, rapidly enough. And we need cancer therapies that, can't, that target only cancer cells and leave healthy cells uh, untouched. In the energy domain, one can make a very long list, but certainly we need better batteries, we need cheaper photovoltaic cells, we need lower impact biofuels, we need ways to capture and sequester carbon dioxide affordably, we need safer nuclear fuel cycles, and it would be nice when we start thinking about what we're going to do for an encore after 2050, it would be nice if we could master controlled thermonuclear fusion. In the domain of climate change, we need better monitoring, both in situ and from space, to understand better and in more detail exactly what is happening. We need better models on faster computers. We need regional disaggregation of impacts to a much greater degree than we have been able to achieve up until now in order to support, among other things, adaptation. All adaptation, in a sense, is local and regional, even though the driving forces that require it are global. And we need, of course, and I hope this organization will continue to play the leading role in this domain that it has played up until now, we need better scientific communication for public understanding of the character of the climate change challenge. In terms of national and homeland security, we need a better ability to detect both conventional and nuclear explosives and to detect clandestine weapon facilities in other countries. We need faster identification of and response to bio threats, which may be human engineered as well as natural, and we need better defenses against cyber threats. 
Let me turn to the cross-cutting foundations of strength in science and technology, which I mentioned before. One of those foundations is the set of institutions that do most of our basic research in this society. Our great research universities, our national laboratories, and the non-profit uh, research centers that do basic research as well. Other aspects of infrastructure are key foundations to strengthen science and technology. Uh, information technology and broadband, high-speed computing, energy and transportation infrastructure, space technology, an important uh, element of infrastructure for a great many uh, scientific, commercial, uh, and technological purposes. Another key foundation of strength, obviously, is our capacity and our success in science, technology, engineering, and math education, STEM education as we abbreviate it uh, in Washington. Uh, confusingly, we're not talking about stem cells. Uh, we're talking about science and math and, and, and engineering. And this is a challenge that extends from preschool to grad school and into lifelong learning. We need to do better at this, and we need to do, uh, we need to do better at it for a number of reasons. We need to do better at it not only uh, to educate the next generation of folks like you in this room who will address the great science and technology challenges of the 21st century, but we need it in order to have a technology-savvy workforce and we need it to have a science-savvy citizenry that can function effectively in a democracy where more and more of the issues on the policy radar screen have science and technology components. Uh, another pillar uh, are the economic and policy conditions that are conducive to, that help promote entrepreneurship, innovation, uh, partnerships in technology. And those things include uh, such items as intellectual property rights, financing, for innovation, tax policy, export policy, immigration policy, and transparency and predictability in regulation. All of those affect the pace and the magnitude of innovation that we're able to build on our strengths in science and technology. I now turn to a few words about our federal support infrastructure for science, technology, and innovation and say a little bit about the role uh, of my office, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, in relation to other uh, agencies and entities in this domain. Uh, Congress, of course, is immensely important, particularly through the Science and Technology Authorizing and Appropriations Committees. We have an array of science and technology rich cabinet departments and the agencies that sit within them, defense within it, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, the Department of Health and Human Services, within it, the National Institutes of Health, the Food and Drug Administration, the Center for Disease Control, the Department of Energy, within it, ARPA-E, the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy, the Commerce Department, within it, NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, and NIST, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, the Interior Department with its USGS, and I note right down in the front row, we have the distinguished heads of both NOAA and the USGS, uh, Jane Lubchenco and Marsha McNutt. Uh, the Agriculture Department, which is National uh, Institute for Food and Agriculture. The State Department has actual substantial roles in uh, science and technology particularly, but not exclusively in the domain of science and technology cooperation in its Office of Environment and Science, uh, headed by Dr. Carrie Ann Jones, very important. Uh, we have a number of freestanding agencies that are science and technology rich, freestanding in that they do not report through a cabinet department, the National Science Foundation, NASA, the Environmental Protection Administration, the Federal Communications Commission, even the Small Business Administration, which you may not think of initially as a science and technology rich entity, but it is. It is much engaged in the business of promoting entrepreneurship and innovation using science and technology to advance our economic goals. And then there is the office where I sit, the executive office of the president, commonly called the White House, where we have the Office of Science and Technology Policy, OSTP, working closely together with a number of other White House offices, uh, and I will show you uh, the rest in this picture. Uh, OSTP sitting in the EOP, the executive office of the president, together with the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, the Council on Environmental Quality, CEQ, the Office of Energy and Climate Change, OECC, the Domestic Policy Council, DPC, heavily engaged, by the way, in both health issues and in education issues, uh, including science and math education. The National Economic Council, where innovation is 
the buzzword in the National Security Council, which has within it the Homeland Security Council, uh, dealing with that set of challenges in the uh, national and homeland security domain that I already described. Responsibilities of the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House and the President's Science and Technology Advisor, myself in this case, uh, are two-sided. Policy for science and technology and science and technology for policy. In the first category, that's a division, by the way, initially proposed by the late great Harvey Brooks, who in many cases was the dean of analysts of science and technology policy in this country for many years. And he talked about this two-sided coin of policy for science and technology and science and technology for policy. In the first category, what he meant and what we mean today in terms of policy for science and technology is the analysis, the recommendations, the coordination with other White House offices on what the R&D budget should be and the policies related to the management of R&D. Uh, policies related to science and technology education and workforce issues, interagency science and technology initiatives and the management of those, broadband, open government, scientific integrity, those all fall under this first category. In the second category, science and technology for policy means being able to provide independent and one hopes objective advice for the president and his other senior advisors about the science and technology that is germane to whatever policy issue he may be concerned with. And he is, of course, today concerned with all of the ones that I listed uh, at the beginning of these remarks. And OSTP has the responsibility augmenting the science and technology talent available to the administration uh, from across the executive branch agencies. You have this in-house capacity in the White House that helps draw upon and funnel key aspects of this information uh, to the president. The position I hold is actually dual-hatted. Uh, the assistant to the president for science and technology is a position not subject to Senate confirmation as a member of the president's personal senior staff. But the position of director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy is subject to Senate confirmation because that is a statutory office that was created uh, by uh, statute, created uh, by uh, the Congress. That creates uh, some interesting tensions because it means in my capacity as the director of OSTP, I am subject to being subpoenaed and compelled to testify before committees of Congress. In my capacity as the assistant to the president, I am not subject to subpoena and being compelled to testify. And so the uh, Office of the White House Counsel and my general counsel in OSDP have to decide when uh, I am asked to testify whether this is an invitation we will accept or not, depending on whether it relates to my functions as director of OSTP, or they're trying to pry out of me the content of my private conversations with the president. And of course, um, there are often uh, attempts to cross that line, which I need to resist. Uh, the Office of Science and Technology Policy has four uh, associate directors uh, for science, uh, for technology, and the associate director for technology is also the chief technology officer of the executive branch. Uh, for environment and for national security and international affairs. All of those positions uh, are also subject to Senate confirmation. We have a staff of about 100, uh, over 70 of whom are uh, technical professionals, scientists, engineers, uh, some social scientists as well. And two-thirds of them are detailed from other agencies. Our budget is a mere $7 million. Our clout in the government comes neither from our size nor from our budget, which are very small by government standards. Our clout comes from our connectivity across the science and technology communities inside and outside of government, and it comes, of course, from our access uh, to the president and his other senior advisors. Those detailees are extremely important. They come from USGS, from NOAA, from NASA, from NSF, from DOD, from DOD, and they help us connect to the science and technology expertise that is out there in those agencies and while they're at it, they learn more about how the White House works, insights that are appropriate and valuable in those agencies when they return after their service with OSTP. Uh, this is what the organization chart looks like with the names filled in of the uh, current incumbents uh, in, these, uh, in these positions. Uh, I think this is uh, the first time in history that we have had a uh, Nobel laureate in science in OSTP our Associate Director for Science, uh, Dr. Carl Wyman. I mentioned Anish Chopra is both Associate Director for Technology and the CTO 
of the government. Sherry Abbott, our Associate Director for Environment, who talked here uh, earlier uh, today, and Phil Coyle, our Associate Director for National Security and International Affairs. I also have a roaming Assistant Director at large who I deploy uh, wherever, I, wherever I need to. Uh, Steve Fetter is an expert in nuclear weapons issues, in energy issues, and in climate change issues, and is therefore highly deployable, uh, including as a substitute for me when I need to be in two places at once. Uh, Tom Khalil, a wide-ranging deputy director for policy. Jim Kohlenberger, the, the uh, chief of staff, uh, who was the domestic policy chief for Al Gore during the Clinton administration, um, immensely experienced in this domain. And we have the interesting situation, uh, historically, uh, only the director of OSTP held the title of assistant to the president, but with the creation of the position of CTO, we now have two assistants to the president in OSTP, Anish Chopra also uh, holds, uh, holds that title. I should also mention that it's the first time in more than a decade that all four of the associate director positions in OSTP are actually occupied. Throughout the Bush administration, the positions of associate director for environment and associate director for national security and international affairs were left vacant. We also manage some very important and closely related entities. We manage the National Science and Technology Council, NSTC, which consists of deputy secretaries and undersecretaries of cabinet departments with science and technology missions, plus the heads of a great many of those agencies within and, and separate from uh, cabinet departments that deal with science and technology. The NSTC is nominally chaired by President Obama. It's chaired in practice by me, and it's administered, as I say, by OSTP. We have as well the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, PCAST. This is a group of 20 people co-chaired by me and Dr. Eric Lander, the director of the MIT Harvard Broad Institute on Genomics. And uh, there are uh, 18 other uh, members who are leaders in science and technology coming from academia, industry, and non-governmental organizations. Uh, all but me serve in a part-time capacity. They keep their day jobs uh, in the various uh, sectors that they're from and advise the White House on a part-time basis. Uh, typically putting in, though, in terms of all of PCAST's activities, which I'll say a little more about in a moment, typically putting in something that approaches a week or more per month. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the priority that the administration places on science and technology with a few specific examples. Uh, one is the extraordinary array of people from the science and technology domain whom the president has appointed to the presidentially appointed positions across the government. There are five Nobel laureates in science in uh, presidentially appointed positions. Energy Secretary Chu, our Associate Director for Science in OSTP, Carl Wyman, the Director of the National Cancer Institute, Harold Varmus, and two members of PCAST, Mario Molina and Ahmed Zawail. Uh, there has never been anything approaching this number of Nobel laureates uh, in government uh, before. There are another more than 25 members of the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, Institute of Medicine, and American Academy of Arts and Sciences in uh, positions in the administration, including the heads of NIH, NOAA, USGS, FDA, and the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Again, there's never been anything like that proportion of members of the uh, elite science and technology and medicine institutions of the country in presidential positions. We have a CTO and a chief information officer in the White House for the first time, Anish Chopra and Vivek Kundra. We have an engineer running EPA. I'm not sure all of you know that Lisa Jackson is a uh, chemical engineer. It's uh, quite obvious that science, technology, and innovation have never been so prominent in leadership positions in any administration. This shows the president with the first seven members of the National Academy uh, that were appointed uh, in his administration uh, meeting in the National Academy boardroom at the time of his uh, speech to that uh, organization last year. Another indicator of priority is uh, the amount that the president talks about science and technology and the number of events he agrees to take on which feature science and technology. Throughout the campaign and throughout his presidency so far, the president has given an extraordinary number of major addresses around science and technology themes. And he has done an amazing number of events in the White House 
with kids who have won national competitions in science and math and robotics in city planning uh, from middle schools and high schools across the country. Uh, meet meetings with the winners of the National Medals of Science and of Technology and Innovation, meetings with groups of astronauts. Seven times we've had groups of astronauts, uh, mostly recently returned from the International Space Station uh, in the Oval Office. Uh, the, the winners of the U.S. Nobel Prize, uh, with which, that is the U.S. winners of the Nobel Prize, sorry about that, uh, with whom uh, the President has met each year. Uh, winners of Math and Science Teaching Awards, the winners of the Presidential Early Career Awards in science and engineering. No president has ever talked as much about science, technology, and innovation as this president has. Uh, this uh, is um, meeting with uh, middle school mathletes, the name of the competition, the national competition in mathematics uh, that, these, uh, that these kids won uh, in the Oval Office. What the president has asked of PCAST is extraordinary. He has requested uh, from PCAST 10 studies so far. Um, all uh, but two of these now completed and delivered to the president uh, and released publicly, uh, making recommendations on how to improve our position in science and technology in all these respects. PCAST has never uh, been asked to do as much so early uh, in any uh, administration. Uh, this is the president meeting uh, with his PCAST in, the, um, in what's called the uh, family dining room. In, uh, the, in the East Wing uh, of the White House. Initiatives in science and technology. Of course, talking is great. Meeting with science and math winners is great. Uh, but in the end, among other things, you want to look at the money. Science got an enormous boost in the stimulus and recovery package, formerly call, formally called the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, uh, and in the 2009 and 2010 budgets. Uh, 2009, 2010, federal research spending was the highest ever. The total funds for science and technology in the Recovery Act exceeded $100 billion. And the president announced in his speech at the National Academy of Sciences in April 2009 the goal of doubling the budgets of key basic science agencies, the National Science Foundation, the DOE Office of Science, and the NIST laboratories over the space of a decade announced his determination to make the research and experimentation tax credit permanent to boost the rate of investment in R&D in the private sector, and indeed announced the goal of lifting the sum of public and private investment in R&D in our country to equal to or greater than 3% of GDP. It's never been that high. It was 2.9% of GDP at the height of the space race in the late 1960s. It was 2.7% when we came into office. It's 2.8 to 2.9 now. Uh, we're going to get there. And the early commitments and the investments uh, will continue if the Congress will agree. The President's FY 2011 uh, budget proposals, not yet uh, enacted uh, by the Congress, uh, would have all federal R&D reaching nearly $150 billion. Non-defense R&D would be up nearly 5% in real terms. Uh, the sum of all research, basic and, and applied, that is R&D minus the D, uh, would be up 4.5% uh, in real terms. NASA R&D would be up 17% in real terms. Uh, NIH up 2%, extra billion dollars. Uh, basic research up over 3% in real terms. Uh, even in the Department of Defense, which we don't ordinarily think of as a bastion of basic research, uh, basic research in the 2011 budget would reach $2 billion, uh, an 8% increase over the preceding year. Uh, and NSF, DOE Office of Science, and the NIST labs would be on track under the 2011 budget proposal of the present president to double over the decade from 2007 to 2017. In energy and environment, there was $80 billion for clean and efficient energy in the Recovery Act. Uh, ARPA-E was created and funded at $400 million for 2009 and 10, and $300 million more proposed for 2011. New energy innovation hubs um, at $25 million apiece. Uh, the first ever fuel economy and CO2 combined tailpipe standards for light duty vehicles. Strengthened bilateral partnerships on energy and climate change with China, India, Russia, and more. Uh, we've been reviving the U.S. Global Change Research Program with a proposed budget for 2011 up nearly 20% uh, 
in real terms. And I'll say more about what it's doing with that money in a few minutes. Uh, we have a new interagency task force led by the Office of Science and Technology Policy, the Council on Environmental Equality, and NOAA on coordination of the government's adaptation activities. We have a new national oceans policy and going with it a new national oceans council. This is the president signing the executive order creating uh, the new national oceans council and establishing the national oceans policy uh, in July of this year. It's co-chaired, the council co-chaired by me and Nancy Sutley on the CEQ chair uh, on either side uh, of the president. The uh, executive order in question establishes the first ever national policy for stewardship of the ocean, our coasts, and the Great Lakes. It creates, as I've already mentioned, a National Ocean Council, which is populated at the cabinet level to provide sustained, high-level, coordinated attention to advance that national policy. It prioritizes nine categories for action to address the most pressing challenges in this domain, and it establishes a flexible framework for effective coastal and marine spatial planning to address conservation, economic activity, user conflict, and sustainable use of ecosystem services. And I would be remiss if I did not uh, mention the fingerprints of Dr. Jane Lubchenco, which are all over this uh, particular uh, achievement. The priority objectives, four priority objectives to improve the way we do business, ecosystem-based management, coastal and marine spatial planning, to inform decisions and improve understanding, coordination and support. Five areas of focus, resiliency and adaptation to climate change and ocean acidification, regional ecosystem protection and restoration, water quality and sustainable practices on land, uh, understanding and uh, responding to changing conditions in the Arctic Ocean, and ocean, coastal and Great Lakes observations and infrastructure. The way this thing is organized, oh goodness, look at this. I didn't realize this was animated. Get it all up there. Uh, the way this is organized is indicated here. Uh, we have uh, a governance coordinating committee that has state, tribal, and local officials on it, an ocean research and resources advisory panel, uh, connections to the relevant offices in the White House, the National Security Council, Economic Council, Office of Energy and Climate Change. Uh, and a variety of interagency uh, policy committees. I'm going to go through this very quickly. The president announced in September of 2009 a new American innovation strategy, which combines a number of the things I've talked about so far here, the building blocks of innovation, education, fundamental research, and infrastructure, and developing <clears throat> an advanced information technology ecosystem, competitive markets to spur innovation, funding, entrepreneurship, public sector and community innovation, American exports, focusing on national priorities where the market failures of various kinds call for the government to intervene, unleash a clean energy revolution, support advanced vehicle technology, drive breakthroughs in health information technology, and address the other big challenges with public goods and externality dimensions. All of these efforts include increased support for scientists and engineers early in their careers. We judge that extremely important and an area in which we have been lagging for some time. They include increased support for commercializing university research and increased support for multidisciplinary and high-risk, high-return forms of research, as we see, for example, in the new ARPA-E. A variety of initiatives in science, technology, engineering, and math education. This has been an extremely active area, a big collaboration between the White House, both OSTP and the Domestic Policy Council, with the Department of Education, NSF, Health and Human Services, the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy, NASA, NOAA, I could add, USGS, I could add. Virtually all of our science and technology agencies are engaged in one way or another with our education initiatives. That's as it should be and must be. A set of new national goals, which again the President uh, enunciated uh, more than a year ago. Uh, funding in race to the top, uh, including preference to states whose proposals for their share of that race to the top money in the Recovery Act emphasize innovation in science, technology, engineering, and math education. 
an Educate to Innovate program that the President announced in November of 2009 to improve K through 12 <clears throat> STEM education with an initial $500 plus million dollars in support, uh, not government money, but private sector and philanthropic money. And the reason the private sector major corporations, GE, Microsoft, Google, Eastman, and others, are putting this money in is they understand they need a more highly trained science and technology workforce and the only way we're going to get it is if we put more effort into education. We added in uh, September of this year a new element of this called Change the Equation. More than a hundred CEOs of major companies in the United States committing corporate resources to improve classroom teaching in science, math, and engineering uh, in this country. Initiatives on principles and procedures may be the most boring part of what we do, but not unimportant. The new stem cell guidelines announced at the beginning of the administration. New reporting procedures for federal grants, which streamline and make consistent across the agencies the reporting procedures uh, for investigators that have federal grants. Scientific integrity principles ensuring openness, transparency, reliance on peer-reviewed science across federal agencies. There's an asterisk here for a reason you'll see in a moment, uh, but I'll mention open government uh, as well. Expanded access to information and databases at every federal agency. And the asterisk is that on scientific integrity, the president issued in March of 2009 a presidential memorandum which established across the executive branch six principles of scientific integrity which have been in place. Since then, I was tasked in that same memo of developing in concert with the agencies and the Office of Management and Budget a set of guidelines that would elaborate and flesh out those uh, principles. That has been a more challenging task than expected. It's taken much longer than it was supposed to. Um, not for lack of trying, I will assure this group, but uh, I had actually hoped to be able to uh, announce the issuing of those guidelines uh, at or before this meeting. Didn't quite make it, but we are very close. Open government initiative, extraordinary amount of activity here. I'd recommend that you just go uh, to the uh, open government website with the open government dashboard, a whole variety of uh, government data sources now available at data.gov, extremely uh, valuable and extensive databases not previously available and being made available in electronic search, electronically searchable form. Uh, partnerships, working with the private sector, uh, many people are not aware that firms fund two-thirds of U.S. R&D and perform over 70 percent of it. Uh, that's one of the reasons that the President has proposed to make the Research and Experimentation Tax Credit permanent. The Recovery Act has helped start and grow clean energy businesses across the country. The Small Business Innovation Research Initiative is providing funding from lots of agencies for a variety of avenues of innovation. The Small Business Lending Bill signed in September of this year increases loans and tax cuts for entrepreneurs and the DOE's energy innovation hubs are linking national labs, universities and industry in major thrusts of clean energy research. Uh, prizes and challenges have become an important part of the administration's approach to stimulating innovation, a way to harness the ingenuity that's out there in our society. Uh, and in these, sponsors and organizers set an ambitious goal but don't prescribe how to get there. And then, and then different groups and individuals compete uh, for the best way to meet that goal. We now have a one-stop website, challenge.gov, that tells you about all the challenges that are out there at any given moment in which uh, people and groups can participate. Recent Automotive X Prize is a good illustration of the potential of this. Ten million dollars in prizes were put up uh, by the private sector. Uh, for super fuel efficient passenger vehicles, those that would get over 100 miles per gallon of gasoline equivalent. And that 10 million in prizes brought forth more than 100 million dollars in investments by the groups competing to win the prize. The winning designs achieved up to 200 miles per gallon of gasoline equivalent. And some of them were gorgeous, as, um, as this, uh, this winner uh, indicates. International science and technology uh, cooperation, cooperation in innovation uh, has included reviving and strengthening the high-level joint commission meetings on science and technology cooperation, which I co-chair with the science ministers of China, India, Brazil, Japan, South Korea, and Russia separately. Uh, convening the multilateral economic forum and the bilateral strategic and economic dialogues with strong 
innovation focuses, pursuing increased international cooperation in space, streamlining the visa procedures that apply to visiting scientists and technologists. And the President, of course, made science and technology a centerpiece of his speech at Cairo in June of last year, in which he announced uh, an innovation in the form of science envoys leading American scientists who would be dispatched initially to Muslim-majority countries and ultimately to a wider variety of countries to help establish improved communications, more cooperation, new centers of excellence. And the new development strategy which Dr. Raj Shah has put in place at USAID is built around science, technology, and innovation as the core of our development strategy. Uh, the first two cohorts of uh, science envoys, the first cohort was Bruce Alberts, former president of the National Academy of Sciences and now the editor-in-chief of science, Elias Zerhouni, the former head of the National Institutes of Health, and Ahmed Zawail, Nobel laureate in chemistry professor at Caltech. They have, uh, have done their service, uh, spending typically more than a month in the countries uh, they visited. Uh, a new cohort has recently been appointed, Rita Caldwell, the former head of the National Science Foundation, Gabisa Ajeta, recent recipient of the World Food Prize, uh, Alice Gast, the president of Lehigh University, very distinguished engineer, uh, will shortly be departing on their trips. Uh, a variety of, uh, of priorities uh, have become the focuses of these envoy visits. They're listed here, and I'm running short on time, so I'm uh, going to let you just uh, look at these quickly rather than uh, saying much more uh, about it. Uh, we have been engaged in a variety of ways in building up uh, U.S. science and technology cooperation. Uh, new centers of excellence are already uh, underway or in the advanced stages of planning on water, climate change, and energy. We have a joint OSTP National Security Council Global Engagement Policy Committee. The State Department recently established 12 new science officer positions in regional embassies. We have a new National Science and Technology Council subcommittee on international science and technology, and you can read all about that stuff on OSTP's uh, webpage here. And we will post uh, this PowerPoint on the White House uh, OSTP website uh, in the next day or so, so things I've gone by too quickly uh, can be uh, gone back to. Uh, there's a lot I could say about the way ahead, what we want to do next, but I'm going to, in view of the time, talk about only one of those, uh, the way ahead on climate change, which I thought somehow might be of particular interest uh, to this group. The strategy of the administration is to, first of all, promote recognition that the climate challenge is real and that early action is preferable to waiting, because the longer we wait, the bigger the damage from climate change and the more rapid the emissions reductions will need to be in order to stabilize the atmosphere. A second point is that prudent early action is likely to be cheaper than either inaction or delay when one takes into account the damage costs that ultimately will ensue. A third key point is that we can reduce costly and risky oil imports and dangerous air pollution with the same measures in many cases that we employ to reduce climate disrupting emissions. And so these can be win-wins or win-win-wins uh, in terms of multiple goals achieved. And the needed surge of innovation, and I've mentioned this already, the needed surge of innovation in clean energy technologies and energy efficiency is going to create new businesses, new jobs, help drive economic recovery and growth and maintain global competitiveness. And if you don't think the latter is potentially a problem, you should take a look at what China is doing in these domains. We want to make climate change mitigation and adaptation a priority for initiatives in departments and agencies employing the existing authorities that those department and agencies have. We want to continue to strengthen the US GCRP and other interagency efforts. We want to, as difficult as this might be, work with the new Congress on initiatives that will accelerate the transition to cleaner and more efficient energy options that can bring these multiple economic, environmental, and security benefits. And we want to continue to work with the other major emitting countries to build technology cooperation and individual and joint climate policies, again, for both mitigation and adaptation. There was an executive order issued already in October 2009 about reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the federal government as part of a larger sustainability strategy. The letter 
most recently issued by me and my counterpart, the chairman of the, the director of the Office of Management and Budget, which we issue every year to agencies about the science and technology priorities we want to see reflected in their budgets, called for priority on understanding, mitigating, and adapting to climate change and for supporting a new national climate assessment that covers all of those bases. We've been strengthening broad interagency efforts around, uh, around the climate change challenge and will continue to do so. We have what we call the Green Cabinet, convened by the director of the White House Office of Energy and Climate Change, but including the secretaries of the departments most involved with climate-related issues and the other agencies so involved. The National Science and Technology Council has uh, uh, broadened the mandate of its Committee on Environment and Natural Resources, chaired by Sherry Abbott of OSTP, Jane Lubchenco of NOAA, and Paul Anastas as EPA. It's now the Committee on Environment, Natural Resources, and Sustainability. I mentioned already a Climate Change Adaptation Task Force, chaired by OSTP, CEQ, and NOAA, uh, and the U.S. Global Change Research Program. I promise to say more about that time is running short. So I think, knowing that most of you know something about the U.S. GCRP anyway, I'll just flash this up there and go on. We propose uh, in 2011 a nearly 20 percent real increase in the U.S. GCRP's budget, and we have included very conspicuously, in addition to the usual science focuses, a focus on adaptation and a focus on integrated assessment. But the linchpin of progress in science and technology policy, I believe, is a committed president, and fortunately, we have one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me, uh, yeah. Don't go away, John. Uh, what a wonderful way to launch AGU's Science and Policy Lecture Series. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure that there are uh, many of you in the audience who have uh, questions on this wonderful overview of how the Obama administration values science and how it uses it in formulating policy. So we'll take a few questions, recognizing that uh, some of you may have to leave for sessions that start in a few minutes, and uh, you're, you're certainly welcome to do that. Please do it quietly because uh, we don't want to lose this opportunity uh, to explore through a few questions some of these issues more thoroughly. Yes, so, so, I, uh, uh, two quick questions. Yes, so the microphones are in the aisles, okay. and uh, we'll start. I, I couldn't be more impressed with your presentation and all the efforts you're doing. Good luck in all of this. The obvious question is your asterisks, Congress willing. Do you have any notion for how the budgets you've proposed might make it, given the change in the Congress and all of these things? What's the uh, other side of the aisle think about a lot of this? Well, first of all, we will know a little more this week because we're uh, very much expecting that in the lame duck session we will either get uh, an omnibus, uh, omnibus budget bill for 2011 or we'll get a continuing resolution with a variety of so-called anomalies, which means that under the continuing resolution you don't have to do exactly what you did the previous year. And so we'll, we'll have some initial indication uh, from the current Congress in its lame duck session of how much of this we're going to get into the 2011 budget. As for 2012, uh, that will be a big challenge working with the new Congress whose composition is obviously somewhat less favorable to the Democrats than the last one. Uh, at the same time, uh, my view, and, and the view certainly of a number of my friends on the Republican side of the aisle as well as the Democratic, is that science, technology, and innovation are not fundamentally partisan issues. Innovation to advance the economy, to improve national and homeland security, to protect the environment are really bipartisan values. And my hope is, therefore, that we'll, we will be able to keep much of this out of the domain of poisonous partisan politics and get quite a lot done, but only time will tell. We are determined to do it. Uh, we'll see how much of it we get done. Good luck. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, yeah, my question kind of dovetails on that. Uh, I recognize the difficulty I had with uh, the new Congress, and I was wondering if the EPA is going to be looking at classifying methane and carbon dioxide as a pollutant. Thank well, you. the EPA has already reached uh, an endangerment finding uh, empowered by the Supreme Court decision of not so long ago that uh, greenhouse gases do endanger the public health and welfare. 
uh, that gives them uh, the power to regulate those greenhouse gases under executive authorities. Some people uh, expect that some in Congress may try to uh, remove some of that authority from the EPA. The President has made clear publicly that he does not intend to allow that to happen so that we will have the option in the absence of the comprehensive energy and climate legislation which we hoped to get from the last Congress but didn't. In the absence of that, uh, we do expect that the EPA will be moving uh, to regulate uh, greenhouse gases. And uh, again, time will tell, but the, uh, the determination of President Obama and the determination of Administrator Jackson is uh, to retain and use uh, that authority. Uh, we would have preferred to get it done uh, with legislation that put a price on greenhouse gas emissions one way or the other. That didn't happen. We still expect it will happen in the future. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, the regulatory approaches is one of the tools at hand, and I expect it will be used. John, uh, that was a wonderful, wide-ranging uh, review, but one of the few things you didn't talk about was whether we've made progress or are making progress on rationalizing export control, which of course has enormous implications yep. for our international competitiveness. And the short answer is, is yes. Uh, Granger, I thank you for your uh, praise. I could have made a talk twice as long uh, and, uh, and, 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 and got a lot more in, but the answer is yes, uh, we will actually uh, quite shortly announce uh, a new approach on export controls and um, it's going to be very helpful. Yes, two quick questions, please. Uh, candidate Obama uh, promised to introduce the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty for ratification in the Congress. President Obama have not done so. Why? The second question is that candidate Obama again promised not to use science, use science actually, as a goodwill ambassador to many countries regardless of politics. President Obama, uh, we cannot even export or send seismograph on even scientific books, even FedEx to countries like Syria and Iran. Why? Okay, uh, f on, on the first point, uh, comprehensive test ban treaty, President, uh, the Vice President, Secretary Chu, I, everybody involved uh, remains committed to getting the CTBT ratified. As things turned out, it became important to get the New START agreement, the Strategic Arms Reduction uh, re Agreement with Russia done first. Uh, that's the one we're trying to get done now, perhaps even in the, in the lame duck session. Uh, once that gets done, uh, we will move to try to get the CTBT uh, ratified. Uh, on your second point, this really relates to the question I was asked a moment ago about export controls. We realize that the regime of export controls we have had has been far from ideal. It has controlled a variety of things that don't need to be controlled, that shouldn't be controlled. Uh, we are very close to completion of a comprehensive overhaul uh, of those uh, export control uh, policies. And, uh, and as I mentioned before, those will be announced shortly and I think uh, people will find them uh, a great improvement. Uh, Dr. Holdred, um, the, you mentioned that the Scientific Integrity Directive has been more challenging and um, time-consuming than you expected it to be. Um, one of the things I think you also should mention is the fact that there have been a lot of agencies that have taken steps in the spirits of the President's memo of March 2009, including Administrator Lubchenco and Director McNutt and Admi Administrator Jackson and others. My question is in terms of implementation. Uh, what happens once the directive is released this, uh, this month? Uh, what will OSTP do to ensure that uh, agency heads have the ability to uh, make it a priority? Well, for, first, first of all, uh, the President's memo uh, of last March indicated uh, that it needs to be a priority and indicated the main elements uh, of, of focus that needed to be present. The, uh, the new guidelines will, will flesh that out. Uh, you're right, I could have mentioned a lot of things that have happened positively on the scientific integrity front uh, in between, notwithstanding the absence of the guidelines, and those include uh, very good scientific integrity policies uh, either already in place or put in place in this period in many agencies. I didn't go into that for lack of time. Uh, in terms of OSTP's role once the new guidelines are issued, uh, OSTP will not become the full service shop 
for investigating every suggestion of, uh, of a problem with scientific integrity. The agencies will remain uh, the entities primarily responsible for uh, implementing scientific integrity in their own shops, but of course OSTP will have, as the White House has in many domains, an oversight role. And should it come to our notice that any particular department or agency is having difficulty in implementing its scientific integrity guidelines, then we will work with them to help. We'll, we'll take one more question and we'll have to be This has to do with uh, medical information technology. I'm wondering where you're seeing this going. I'm well aware of uh, computers being used to gather, to gather lab information, doctor's notes, schedule appointments, things like that. Where else, you've mentioned it several times, so where else do you see this kind of technology going in a way that would improve medical care? What, what I would do in the, uh, in the interest of time is refer you to the Health Information Technology Report that was just released last week by PCAST, Report to the President on Health Information Technology, what we need to do, how it can be used, how, what we need to do to protect privacy. It's a huge topic. I wouldn't want to try to summarize it in the minus 30 seconds I think I have left here. But uh, it's a great report. It's on the web. Uh, go to uh, www.ostp.gov, you'll look under PCAST, you'll find it. Thank you. Thank you all very much, really appreciate it. <laughs>